Greetings from the Dark Continent. Conscious Caracal here. And tonight I'm joined by a pretty unorthodox guest, I must say. Someone that doesn't completely agree with me politically, but I think he'll be an interesting uh, participant on Stream of Consciousness and a valuable guest for tonight. My guest tonight is Claude. He is a South African anarchist, and I'm going to give it over to him. Claude, give us a little bit of an idea who you are and what you are about. Well, I'm a South African. I am Afrikaans, um, and I'm very, very proud of my Afrikaans heritage. There's nothing you can do to take that away from me. Um, we, as an Afrikaner race, have have had a bad run. We've we've done some really bad things in the past, but I do think we can we can learn from them. Like we we, we made mistakes, but, but I do think that that we should learn from the mistakes instead of forgetting them. And that's that's really what I'm what I'm trying to do um, with with my uh, like. With my research in, in into to, to politics, um, I I really like learning about history because you can you can get to know a lot about your own ideas if you look at how those ideas have been implemented in the past. And as an Afrikaner race, we went through a very very nationalist stage, and I do think nationalism is is a good thing to some degree, but we'll we'll get to that later. Um, and then, oh yes. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Guys, you're gonna you're gonna have to bear with me for a bit. I'm I'm really really new at this, and it's no yeah. oh, man. It's all good. So at the moment, we are going to discuss the idea of anarchism, and I think it could be very applicable to South Africa in general because, as you've seen from just uh, democracy in general across the world, political systems everywhere are seem to be uh, put under immense strain. As we see from in America, in Europe, in South Africa, it seems that the, the idea that democracy is the god that failed is definitely a, an idea that's being repeated by more and more people worldwide. And it seems that you think the ideas that are contained in anarchism could actually be applicable in the, the modern political environment. Yes, well, okay. So democracy, as, as people generally understand it, is that everyone's equal and, and everyone gets a say. But that's that that looks great on paper, but it doesn't quite work that way in, in practice. Um, a lot of democratic countries, a lot of Western countries have a, a representative democracy where some people get up on a podium and they tell you a bit about themselves. And then they say, these are the things that I believe. These are the things that I want to change. It's not about what the people want. It's about what that person thinks is good for society. And then we go and we vote based on that. Um, but what anarchy calls for is a is is rather a, a more radical form of democracy. Instead of looking at elected political officials, you um, you, uh, you 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 look at the problems in in your society, in your community. So the, the your geographical location, the people you spend your time with online. You look at the problems in there. And then you deal with those because those are the problems that you can fix. You can do it on your own. And that's that's the, the view of what, what I think democracy should have been. But it's not what democracy has become. Democracy has become this, this platform where anybody can go and say anything. And if they have enough support for it, then um, they can do whatever they want. And, yes. and we see this. It's we, it's a it's a lot like the what Weber warned about. It's the tyranny of the majority. It seems like if you look at, for example, how democracy was practiced in ancient Greece, they were dealing with a lot smaller communities, much more tight knit communities, not the, this huge scale that we're seeing today. Democracy in in modern times is almost a perversion of what it was in ancient Greece. You're dealing with millions of people, and not people you know or people that you that are basically in, uh, homogenous in terms of culture and ideas and values. You're dealing with very diverse cultures or diverse societies in many countries. And I think that's putting a lot of strain on democracies, and especially in South Africa, is the fact that you have all these clashing views and all these clashing cultures, and we kind of have to keep everyone happy. Right. So we, we, we don't have to scale up everything as far as we do. Like, um, you can do so much more in a very small, tight-knit community where people know each other rather intimately. Um, because that's how you can fix problems quickly. But then scaling it up in, in, in the form that a government does, um, 
it, it, it creates this divide because the people who ultimately have to deal with the problem aren't part of the community. They're not there. They don't see this 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 pothole or this corruption of um or or police brutality or whatever. They just hear about mm. it. They're not they're not there to stop it. And um the the it, it, it's laughable to think that the government can really stop people from doing anything. They can only prosecute people who have already done something wrong. Mm. And I think it's, as well, the thing that I've, I've been seeing a phenomenon is the fact that the rise of populism is you see basically populism is a hack of the system. People are exploiting democracy in terms of just getting uh, promising people uh, resources and making empty promises and getting the, the crowd and the rabble riled up. But at the same time, then they are just cheating the, the system in order to get support. But as soon as they get into power, then nothing happens. There's this cautionary tale, uh, this African cautionary tale that I always uh, use to demonstrate this idea. So there was this African leader that promised his constituents, if you vote for me, I'll give you all free shoes. And then in the election, he won by a landslide. And then everyone comes to him and says, well, where's our free shoes? And then he looks at them and he sneers and he says, ha, ah, but none of you gave me your shoe size. So that's exactly what's happening with a lot of these populist leaders, that they make all these empty promises. It's almost like uh, if you uh, a good uh, a good reason or a good uh, metaphor to why democracy doesn't really work in the uh, in practicality is if you look at for example the idea of the Kruger National Park. If you give the animals the the right to vote, then all the 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 antelope out, outnumber the the lions hundred to one. So they will all vote to outlaw predatory and uh, carnivorism and to outlaw the lions basically but is that fair is that really a, a, a desirable outcome i mean it's a democratic outcome i, I like that, that that you used an animal metaphor because animals are, are distinctly different species they, they they come from two distinctly different uh uh origins but with humans the the, the problem is a lot more nuanced because we, we all kind of look and act and think the same way. We've got the same faults. Um, we're, we're all predisposed to, to pretty much the same diseases, although some races and genders do better with some diseases than others. Um, like that's, that's a genetic fact. Um, but who, who gets to say that one human being has the right to tell any other human being how to behave? Like you can, you can make suggestions. I mean, we, we, we see some friend groups where if someone's acting a little uh, dodgy, so to speak, you know, doing something that, that you don't necessarily agree with, you can give them advice. You can tell them, listen, have you ever looked at it this way? But what, what government does is it tries to, to curtail human behavior by, um, by, by telling them, no, if you do this, we are going to lock you up. We are going to ruin your life. You're going to become a pariah. And that's, that's not the way to do it. That's how you create enemies. That's not how you progress as a society. Well, yeah, you, the other day you mentioned on Twitter um, the idea of being locked into the system, that idea of from the day you were born, you were basically uh, a cog in the system, if you could elaborate on that. Um, well, okay, so everyone is is born somewhere in the world, right? That That's just, you know, how it is. But where you're born, your geographical location, the, the, the country in which borders you're born determines your uh political course for a very long time for for at least 18 years until you get the same rights as every other adult in in, in the country or, or whatever the, the the age of consent or, or voting age or whatever it is there's there's this barrier where you don't really get a say in what happens um and to some degree i i, I agree with this kind of system with with this viewpoint that don't just let any young idiot say what they want and do what they want because that's that's how you ruin society um, we should listen to them because they they see the world differently. And when you're born, you 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 don't get a choice whether you want to be a a, a democrat um, or a communist or a socialist or whatever. Where you're born kind of just determines that. And same I with mean, religion. Yes, it's the same with religion. If you're born in a very religious community, chances are you're going to be religious yourself. There's a there's there's a rather strong chance that you're going to to disregard everything your religious elders told you, and you're going to go against that, become an atheist or or, or assume another religion. And in the same way, you can 
um, break away from uh, any political ideology or that, that that might be the status quo in your country and and do something else. Um, but people aren't really going to like that because now you're different. Now you're a problem. Now you're a thorn in their side. And um, yeah, they like can't can't you just play along? Regardless of of whether you're playing along or not, um, is is to the betterment of society. Um, they just don't like you. They they want to suppress you. They they, they want to put you away in a corner where you can't do anything. You can't really say anything. You can't hurt anybody. It's fine. Everything just goes on as it is. Yeah, just be a good little cog in the system, basically. Yes. And uh, just for, I think I uh, skipped over this at the beginning, just for transparency's sake for the audience, uh, could you give us an idea where you lie on the political compass, where on the spectrum? Um, if you take the, the, the political compass from the, the political compass website, then um, I'm a libertarian socialist, but I don't completely agree with that. I, I think I'm rather more foundational anarchist. I don't believe in any sort of... Um, uh ultimate power structure so um i don't believe anybody has the right to dictate what i get to do with my life if i want to do something you have to let me let me do it or you have to convince me that it's not the right thing to do um and people people think that that this necessarily leads that that this anarchistic point of view necessarily leads to chaos but it doesn't um, I mean, chaos would be everybody just committing evil wherever they go, you know, stealing, raping, murdering, whatever, a total ruin of society. But anarchy proposes that that you don't need a government to tell you what's right and wrong. You don't need any institution that forces you to live in a certain way to keep society from happening like that. Because... And I want to ask everybody listening right now, do you want to commit evil? Do you see yourself as a murderer? Do you see yourself raping someone? Do you see yourself doing what you consider to be an immoral act? And yes, from time to time, people slip up and shit happens. But um, you can't live your life in fear of that. You need to do what you want to do without infringing on anybody else's right to do the same. So I can live my life in a certain way that doesn't affect you. And then that means that you can't, if, if, if it doesn't affect you directly or it doesn't affect your community, don't judge me for it because it doesn't matter to you. Mm, um, no, I, I completely agree with you there. And here's the thing though. So we've been pretty critical from the get-go on democracy. Could you maybe tie that into anarchism? Where does the disdain for democracy lie within the core of anarchism? I believe it's um, Winston Churchill that said uh, something about the, 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 the failure of democracy is a five minute conversation with the average voter. <laughs> the, 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 the whole voting situation is, is completely rigged to people in the know. Right. And, and a lot of people don't care about politics because it's the government's problem. You know, if, if there's a pothole or a, a, a drug addict or a, a drug dealer in your town or a murderer or, or whatever, it's the government's problem. It's the police's problem. You know, I don't have to do anything because there is this thing that does it for me. I voted for this thing. But why would you vote for this thing when this thing, the government, has time on time proven that it does not give a fuck about you? Mm -hmm that it doesn't care about your problems, that it only cares about lining its own pockets with money and then, um, you know, promising things, you know, good, really idealistic things for, 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 uh, for the next election and then just not following through with it. Why yeah, do you turn uh, it It relates to that quote, um, the, the war created the state and the state created war. Yes. Right. So the... The government creates these enemies and they, they, they claim that these things are the enemies of the people, but really it's just the enemies of the government. It's not, and South Africa during apartheid was a really good, is, is a really good example of this because um, the, the people that, that are now called freedom fighters, you know, um, Nelson Mandela, Stephen Biko, um, Winnie Mandela that died, um, you know, rest in peace, <laughs> all that. Um, <clears throat> they, they're called freedom fighters now, but they were called terrorists during apartheid. Yeah. 
They were the enemies of the state, but they were from within the state. Um, so, and and now, and I agree with, with um, fighting against apartheid. I agree with that ideology. I don't agree with everything they did to achieve the, the dissolution of the apartheid state, but I, um, I agree with, with the fact that the apartheid state was authoritarian and it was oppressive. It, it, it took rights away from people. Yeah, and that's, you, yeah, you basically agree with the sentiment that you have to question authority, you have to stand up to tyranny, if I'm correct. Yes. Um, the, the, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing, right? And that, that's, that's not nothing in the sense that you don't act. It's, it's also nothing in the sense that you don't even ask the question. You don't care. What that tells me that they don't care about politics, I think, is an absolute moron because politics is literally what your life for the foreseeable future is about. Okay, so here's a question from the chat. A uh, common sense guy asks uh, If democracy is so bad, why does it always improve any state it's been implemented in? I'll give you a few seconds to ponder that. Um. Okay, so while you digest that, uh, basically, that your views kind of align with mine. The, the idea of, I think democracy is necessary, I'll answer this while you think. I think democracy is a pretty necessary thing for a free society, but at the same time, democracy needs to have limits. I think there's a, there's a term, uh, militarized democracy, where basically you give everyone freedoms and rights. But as soon as they use those freedoms and rights to undermine the system, they basically hack the system. They use the privilege, privileges they're given by democracy to overthrow the democracy. Then I think force may be used to uh, subdue those forces and use that to basically retain the system. You can't hack the system and use the system's own freedoms and privileges against it. Yeah, okay. So you, you, you said that democracy needs limits. Um, and, and those yeah. limits, I think, are, are, are largely uh, size related. To, um, to, to answer the question, it's d democracy improves the state that it's implemented because it's better than anything we've had up until now. We've gone through monarchies, we've gone through really authoritarian governments, um, we've gone through communism, we've gone through brief bouts of socialism, but democracy just seems to work because more people get a say in what happens. But the, the problem that I think is, the thing I think is the problem with the democratic state is that um, it's too big. It's way too big to manage that many people. I mean, South Africa is, is last time I checked, on, on 53 million, right? And yet it's big, but it's not nearly big enough to manage 53 million people. Imagine being in charge of that many people. And it's not even 53 million people that have the same religion, culture, and uh, herit heritage and ethnic background. These are people with vastly different values, cultures, and ideas about in what direction we need to take the country. I mean, there's 11 official languages in South Africa. So how 12, do you keep... 12. Well, um, yeah. So how sign language you... is accepted now, I think. Oh, all right. Okay. Uh, the more you know. Dun, 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 dun. So basically, the idea is how do you how do you keep everyone in a in a country of fifty three million? We're not even talking about a country the size of America with uh, three hundred and fifty million. How do you keep all these clashing values and all these clashing cultures happy? How do you serve them all? So the thing is, uh, and I think this this relates back to Plato's five regimes. So Plato had this theory back in the D that uh, any country, any nation goes through a natural life cycle. It starts off as an aristocracy, then it degenerates into a timocracy, which degenerates into an oligarchy, which then degenerates into a democracy, which then finally degenerates into a tyranny. And that's where the Republican model came from, because then the Romans realized, OK, if this is true, if every nation goes through this natural life cycle, if we divide a country up into smaller parts, but they all still kind of work together like the United States, then every one of the smaller parts goes through this life cycle of aristocracy, democracy, oligarchy, democracy, tyranny. But the whole, the country as a whole goes through that process slower because it's been uh, demarcated or kind of uh, broken up. So they kind of found a hack, a way to pause society in democracy for much longer than it would have done if it was just one homogenous country. But here's the thing, and I think this is definitely, this is my own personal theory on what's going on in the world today. 
is I think we're now in late stage democracy. The world's been paused in democracy for so long that it's being strained. The next step is tyranny. That's where it's naturally going towards if you subscribe to Plato's theory. And I think that's what's currently happening. If you look across the world, uh, I can't remember what the index is called, but there's a freedom index, a pretty respected one, that concluded that the, the, the freedom in the world, total freedom is actually diminishing, not increasing over the past 20 years. And I think that's a symptom of democracy being strained. I think we're going to we're going uh, the the same way that Plato said any country goes, where democracy eventually degenerates into a tyranny. And I think that's kind of where we're going. Just look at China; they just abolished uh, term limits. I mean, and look at uh, Russia as well. You're seeing definitely an encroachment on freedoms. The world is not getting freer from my perspective. It's actually getting more constrained, more centralized, and actually more authoritarian. Uh, do you agree? Um, I, I do agree. And I think it, it, um, if, if, if we look at, the, uh, if we again look to history, we can see why. Because uh, governments usually come around by someone with a really big stick be you force people to follow a certain thing, you lock them up, or you um, kill them, or you completely ostracize them because they don't want to die, they don't want to become pariahs, they kind of just follow to step in line. And then you've got this, this big um, authoritarian government government that dictates everything everybody does and no one except the guy at the very top is absolutely free. Um, putting all of that power into one person's hands is very dangerous. Um, and in, in the modern world with capitalism uh, or capitalism having taken root almost everywhere, um, money has become the stick. Money has become this big stick that we beat people with. If you don't do what I say, I'm not going to hire you. I'm not going to let you look after your own uh, food and water and, and social need. If you do it more uh, uh, pacifistic way of, of beating people into submission, but it's still pretty effective and it's still pretty harsh. Right. But at the same time, I think we're also seeing, like I brought up earlier, the fact that we're seeing the tyranny of the majority. I think uh, if you look at identity politics, I think that's a hacking of the system. I think that's definitely people that start realizing that if I can mobilize an entire ethnicity, or if I can mobilize an entire group in society to just vote one way, and I can completely monopolize them, then basically you can dictate the result of democratic elections for ad infinitum into the future. And I think that's what's happening in America as well, is this increase in identity politics. If you look at, for example, the Democrats that have basically seized the black community in America, they've realized that if we can monopolize certain groups through identity politics, we can ensure that for the next 50, 100 years, they'll vote for us. If we can just entrench them in a certain ideology, and I think that's what's happening. People have realized that if we can get these groups so entrenched, we don't have to worry about every election beginning from scratch. We already have this ready-made support that we can just utilize uh, every time the election comes around. Right. It's it's an ideological army because they – and and I think they, 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 they use some of the same tactics as what the army does to make you such a good little soldier, to make you so obedient to what they want. They They – they tell you you're you're worthless in your current state. You're nothing, you know. And then, but but we can build you up to be this really good thing through us. You can become great. You can become a a, a proud person. Um, and they they do it. They 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 tell you all these lies. They feed your communities with drugs, um, until it's so broken down that. This, the salvation that they offer is actually looking pretty good. And then um, then there's this, this, this feeling of um, I, I owe the Democrats something. I, I owe these people that helped me something. Um, and that, that can stay, in a, stay rooted in a society for a very, very long time. The, the, the feeling of me and mine and my ancestors owe these people something. We need, we need to make it up to them somehow. And the right. only way they can do that at this point is just to vote for them.
regardless so, of what uh, they believe. Seeing as this is the, the anarchy stream and we're talking about American politics and seeing as you're an anarchist, what is your view on Antifa and Black Bloc? Um, yeah, I think like I'm, I'm, I'm all right with what Antifa believes. Like I'm, 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 I'm cool with 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 the idea that that the fascist ideology is bad because that that's what Antifa is. It's it's anti-fascist action, um, but I don't think they're going about it the wrong way by saying that they are anti-fascists because it doesn't tell me what they stand for. It just tells me they're a bunch of hooligans that don't like these other people. Um, yeah, but I don't know. Then you have to ask the question, who are really the fascists? I mean, if Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro are fascists, then, oh my fucking God, man, then then the definition of fascists becomes so broad that it's almost ridiculous. Right, and yeah, and, and I think this is where identity politics fails us. We're, we're so quick to put ourselves and other people in this nice little block of um, fascist or, or, or anarchist or, or democratic or republican or, or whatever that we forget that, that um, people are much more fluid than that. Like I agree with some of the things Mark said. I agree with some of the things um, uh, the, the apartheid government said in principle I think that they could have done it better. I think that they could have done it differently. Um, you know, been been nicer to a lot of people. Um, didn't they, I don't think they needed to use all these these underhanded tactics that they did. Um, but I, I, I do think it's it's. Oh, I kind of lost my point there. Oh yeah, but anyway, the the thing about the the black block, well, the black block phenomenon is that it seems to me, from my own perspective. That it's a lot more about just breaking down the system rather than giving alternatives or actually proposing any solutions. They just want to break something down, but they don't have anything to rebuild after that. Could you yes. elaborate on that? Yes. Okay. So and Antifa really likes causing shit. They, they, they really like causing a riot, but the riot doesn't do anything constructive. Like, like, like you said, it just breaks things down. And if you don't have a plan for how to build things up, afterwards or, or during um or maybe a a preemptive building up then it's it's kind of a waste of time to break it down it's you're, you're like a five-year-old who took apart his his toy plane but has absolutely no idea how to put it back together yeah i always use this metaphor of we're basically adrift in this life raft and there's a small little hole in it and we are kind of patching it up we're managing but it's not perfect and there's one guy in the life raft saying no this life raft is not perfect we need to destroy it and then yes. you're like, well, but then when we don't have a life raft anymore, then we're basically just adrift in the ocean. And he's like, no, we need to destroy it. It's not perfect. And I'm like, right. what else do we have? And I think that's the same with democracy. And I, uh, It's been pointed out in the chat. I can't remember exactly who it was, but it said that democracy is the best we have. It's not perfect. And it definitely has flaws. And that's what we're pointing out. But at the same time, fuck, man, we don't really have anything that's better at ensuring freedom and a free society and in terms of steering government and keeping government in check. See, I, I, I also came to that conclusion of a few years ago. I also thought that democracy was the only thing that 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 we, we have left. Like this, this is we're we're up against a wall. Um, but recently, I've 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 really come to like the idea of anarchism because it it takes the power away from the centralized government that doesn't do anything and it puts the power in your hands. You can become active in your community to change it you can instead of wasting your time um on on your couch watching the news complaining about everything that's bad in in your society you can get up you can look up you can educate yeah. yourself on how to fix problems and then you can go out into the away from the laptop away from your phone and you can help those communities um, yeah, to, to quote Folk of Polisikar, you're clear where the land of our land, but you can do nothing there. So exactly. basically for our international viewers, that lyric translates to you always complain about our the, the state of our country, but do something about it, god damn it. <laughs> right, and there's there's another Folk of Polisikar quote, uh, quote that I also really like. Um, there is time bombs and gabings of opvoeding. Um, there are time bombs left in gaps of education. Um, we, the, we, we, we're not investing in ourselves in the sense that that we can um, 
uh, fix problems in our society. We invest in ourselves to the point where we can fix our own problems, but those problems are only ours or our, um, our, our social problems, you know, between our friends. But we don't equip ourselves to, to fix the more real problems um, that, that, that face us, like the, the uh, murderers or the, the, the thieves or, you know, the racists in society. We don't educate ourselves to try and fix those problems because we... I, I, I actually don't know why why people don't. Um, to me, that's that's the most logical thing. The only person I can trust to do the job right to my to my mind is myself. I can't trust anyone else to do it. Um, so I can I can work together with other people in order to achieve a common goal, but I still need to do something. And do something goes further than just um, giving money to charity. That's 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 kind of uh pointless to me because you're not really doing anything you're trusting someone else to go do it right right if you like rather take part in the charity go there you can take your money you can buy them stuff but teach them something as well go to the communities teach them how to look after themselves because that is what we as humans need to do if we want to survive as a species we need to look after our own because okay, we're yeah. useless on our own. <laughs> I can't argue with that, man. But there's something that's always interested me, and I think uh, the audience will definitely benefit from this, uh, asking an anarchist. Could you please explain to me the difference? Now, I have a basic understanding, but maybe you could teach me something. The difference between the ANCAPs and the ANCOMs and all the different branches of anarchism. Um, okay, so anarchism is is a very salient idea it's a very subtle idea in in society but it's a very salient idea um because it it, it pops up everywhere it's not a purely political theory it's it's got um that there are vegan anarchists who who think that we can't impose our authority over um animals there are um minarchists who believe in 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 a sort of advisory governmental system you know people that that just keep society kind of in check but just leaves them to their own devices for the most part um but the the, the difference between anarcho capitalists and anarcho communists is that um only one of them is is really uh eligible for the title of anarchist because um ancaps believe money should stay currency should stay we should keep on doing commerce as we are then nothing should change we should have a free market now free market i've got very little problem with but i don't think that free market should be dominated by money i don't think money should be a barrier to entry for this because what if you were raised in a very poor society um where you know you, you didn't have access to the right forms of education you didn't have access to the right um uh, people or, or, or the right organizations or the right uh, uh, information to make something of your life. You might have all of these really great ideas. You might be um, the, 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 the next uh, Jesus or Einstein <laughs> or, or whoever, but you didn't have access to this free market because it's not just a free market of goods. It's a free market of ideas as well. You can buy people's ideas. You can change people's ideas with enough money. And that's another way of imposing power onto someone. You can you can keep certain uh, parts of society poor and uneducated and unable to access all the things you have access to, um, and through that you can you can dominate them. You can mold them to be whatever you want them to be, and that is a an an, an immoral act. Um, well, that's just my opinion. I, I I don't think you you should demand that people do anything in, in order f um, f for them to have a better life or whatever. Like if you keep someone in a cage for long enough, then you only need to open the cage, you know, a little bit and people will be happy. Um, well, at the same time, I'd say uh, a baby weaned on poison sees harm as a comfort. Yeah. We and it's like that's how you train horses. I saw this. Uh, I ride horses, and there was this one time when I was riding in the Kalahari, and they have this this tactic where they, when the horse is young, they tie him up to a. Uh, they have this this rope around his neck that that's connected to a, a sharp piece of metal in his mouth. Now it's very cruel what they do, but it's pretty effective. So 
when it's young and it's and you drop the rope and it steps on the rope it yanks it yanks its mouth and then it, it gets hurt so then it learns that when that rope drops you stop because if you keep you keep walking it's like stepping on your own shoelaces so then when the horse is an adult they remove that piece of metal from its mouth but it, but you still have that kind of that uh um br emergency break in your hand that piece of rope so when you're riding your horse and it gets out of control you just drop that piece of rope rope and it just stops dead in its tracks and i think that's how a lot of people have been conditioned by a lot of government policies and by the public education system yeah because i mean if if we can do it to animals it's not such a big leap to start doing it to humans you only need to restrict people's freedom for a little while until they get frustrated with that until it hurts them enough that they just learn not to do something um you can you program someone not you you can't change their mind about something but you can program them to act in a certain way if you if you stop them if you hurt them every time that that, that something like that happens um and that 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 doesn't work it, it's not a good way to teach people things because then they learn things out of fear and fear is very powerful because you can do a lot of things with fear the moment you install enough fear in something you can basically you can control do, its mind yeah, that's social can, engineering you can do anything with it um mm. So, now, wouldn't you say that's how the, the criminal justice system, basically, not just in America, but across the world, has kind of been abused, but it's become the system of fear, where you just coerce your, your basically, your society into this position where they're too afraid to even think the wrong thing. Right. Um, there was there was this, this, this guy on Reddit the other day um, who, who said something, um, he, he got stopped by a cop and um the the he, he didn't ha he didn't do anything illegal he wasn't speeding he didn't have drugs on him like all his affairs were in order but the cop was still suspicious about it because he was too calm he was too calm around this cop so the cop thought that he's been um been been trained or, or he knows how to deal with the police in order to just get away so the cop thought he was um he he was acting suspiciously when he really wasn't this guy just didn't think he had he, he did anything wrong so what does he have to fear but the fact that cops think that way the fact that his his uh calm demeanor was was such a surprise to this policeman means that most people are kind of freaked out by the police most people immediately tense up when they see a police car i know i like even if i'm driving under the speed limit when i see a police car i slow down even more because i don't want to cause shit I, d I don't want them to stop me for any reason and that's bad because now we 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 start stopping ourselves and we we can't stop ourselves. If we want to progress as people, as a society, we need to we need to push for progress. Not progress at um, the cost of anything necessary, but we need to push for 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 good humanitarian progress. And and with people hanging over your shoulder the whole time, making you uh, overthink your your every move, it's it. it it's, it's not a good thing to do. Yeah, it's not a healthy environment for human flourishing. I'd say. Yeah. yeah to, to get back to that point of ANCOMs and ANCAPs, uh, what are you specifically? Where do you fall on the anarchy uh, spectrum? Um, I would call myself an anarcho-syndicalist. Um, it's it's the idea that that groups of people you. Uh, you you start with small groups. You've got maybe f five to ten people who, who form a little, you know, discussion group. They get together, they talk about things, and they all live relatively close to each other. Um, and then they get to to pick a representative um, to represent their ideas. But it's the, the representative isn't like an elected politician. This guy is just chosen to to tell other people what the group is saying, what the group thinks is a problem. And then a group of these representatives can come together and they can discuss things, they can make compromises, they can figure out ways to achieve everybody's goals, not necessarily right now, but in the foreseeable future, we can achieve this and this and this, but we can't do these things. Um, and then the representatives would then go back to their smaller groups and they would talk about it again. And this would then filter up bigger and bigger in society as it, it needs to go. If it's something that can be fixed, um, just by those ten, uh, five to ten people getting together and um, making a decision to fix the potholes or go paint this guy's wall or, or you know, get more books for the library or whatever, then they can do it. They don't have to escalate the problem to some higher 
um, some some higher group of people that has more influence over over, over whatever um, over society. But okay. it's yeah, it's it's not the same way that 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 people go to a municipality because these representatives don't get the ultimate say. It's not their views that they're promoting. It's the group's views that they're promoting. Okay, um, right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, because the the title of the stream is African Anarchy, um, could you maybe elaborate on the how? Anarchy is not only practiced at the moment in Africa, if you have any knowledge on that, or how it could potentially be used, not in just the South, or we can get to South Africa in just a bit, just in the African context. Are there any countries where this is already a system that's in place that's similar to anarchy? Well, um, if you look at the, the, the history, of, the, the political history of, of Africa, and you kind of ignore the colonial period um, to, to, to a large extent, because that's that's very Western democratic authoritarian, whatever you want to call it, um, that, that's not what I think African anarchy is, because it had a, a very strong Western influence. But if you go back be before that, in, in sub-Saharan Africa specifically, because Africa is a big place with a lot of people, and, and like the, the whole northern half of it is um, everything in or above the Sahara is um, uh, more an Arab nation than it is an African nation, I think. Um, so I, I, I looked at, at specifically sub-Saharan Africa, um, and... They've, 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 they've been called monarchies because they are um, structured around a king or a chief or some, you know, ultimate leader. Um, but people misunderstand what this chief's role was. We use the word chief or we use the word king, but we don't mean the same thing. African people and, and Western people mean the same thing when they talk about it. It's not an absolute ruler. It's something, it's someone invested in the community who advises the community. They're seen as someone who is wise, who is very knowledgeable about how communities should function. They're usually someone very old. Um, and they don't get the ultimate say. I read in an article the other day that um, the, the an African king or an African chief would not even be able to declare war or declare peace without the consent of every person in his society. If they still want to go to war, the king has to say, okay, I think this is a bad idea, but I'll support you. You know, I'll be there to make sure that you don't die so that you come out better than what you would have been without me. He helps them. He fights on the front lines with them. And that that kind of, of uh, power structure is, is useful. And... Um, there's, there's in um, Cameroon, they've, they've got this traditional hierarchical structure where you've got leaders um, in the community. They're all kind of on the same level. Um, there's the, the, the chief who, who sort of manages everyone else, um, not manages them, but, but uh, advises them. Um, he's, he's sort of a, a, a general leader. And then you've got leaders for different reasons. You've got leaders because you're the, the, the head of a family. Um, you've got leaders because you um, are maybe a, a spiritual leader, um, a spiritual healer like a, a, a Sangoma or, or, or something like that. You have authority in certain matters, but you don't have ultimate authority. Nobody has ultimate authority over anyone else. The people in the society can go to them for counseling or to or go to them for help, but they but the, the people they go to for help can't force them to do anything. It's up to that person themselves to decide what they want to do. Um, but obviously, a lot of this, uh, a lot of these these communal ideas, this communal ethic of, of everyone helping other people. Because, I mean, everyone is an expert in some field. I'm not very good at carpentry or accounting, but I, I think I know my way around philosophy and linguistics. Um, and if people need help with that, they can come to me and I can, I can give them my best answer and I can do some of the research for them because I know where to look. I know where to find the answers, but I'm not just going to give them what I think they should do. I'm going to give them all their options. Um, if, if, if you want to know more about this, then I'll give you this set of options. Um, that's more how, how a traditional African society worked. 
but then colonialism came along and and we import it, we like Europeans imposed this colonial rule on them their rights were taken away their humanity was taken away um you even had religious institutions that that said that they weren't human um i i read something a few years ago that uh it 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 was an argument for um uh black skin being the mark of cain now if 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 you're not familiar with the mark of cain um after cain killed his brother abel in the bible um god punished him and and, and put some kind of mark or a curse on him and for a long time the catholic church kind of went with the idea that this has to be black skin because they're these heathens they're these completely immoral people who um they who who we don't understand who we don't like who don't follow the rules um who don't follow our rules and they yeah they they they, they yeah, that's how the that's how the european colonizers basically uh, justified their policies was through they used the 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 well the socratic um or was it plato that uh, categorized humans as rational animals so they basically mm. i think it was plato and they came to africa they saw they encountered these people they 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 were you they were definitely human but their their cultures were different so then they looked at their cultures their cultures did not, they their cultures did not resemble european culture and european culture at the time was regarded as civilized and as right so it's it's, it's not mirror the, the european culture so then your their conclusion was then they are not rational therefore they are not human right and and it 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 it's not that they that that they were necessarily that these african cultures were necessarily bad or evil or or chaotic or murderous or anything it's just that they were different people pe- people got together who couldn't really speak the same language so there's there's a lot of miscommunication going on people get the wrong idea they look different they 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 sound different they act differently they wear different things they they organize their societies in different ways and that unknown factor the, the fact that we didn't know how they did it how they made any of this work scared the shit out of us and we had guns <laughs> so we 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 could scare them with our guns and then their ideologies don't scare us anymore right um, so here's the thing uh, when it comes to anarchism uh, i've told you this critique of mine i want to get back on track on the the topic of anarchy right. so the the thing is when it comes to anarchy and this is my main gripe with the ideology and with the political theory it's that how do you stop people from banding together how do you stop for example you have a bunch of small societies that are all anarchic and they basically live together let's say for example at the southern tip of africa now some invading force that have realized shit if we band together we can take the their shit and they can't do anything about it they don't have an army they don't have a government that can basically or national defense then how do you stop external forces or groups in society from ganging up together and basically just mobbing the shit out of your little anarchic uh, society and just ganging up and taking over well these 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 two forces certainly don't live in isolation i mean we we we're moving towards a very global society and if if let's say uh, one group of people one very uh, uh militarily strong in in one country decides to attack another to take their shit um it's up to the other communities in the area to say but hey fuck off you know <laughs> we don't like this this is not right you can't impose that kind of thing on people so it it's up to 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 people to fight for that and it it it's all good and well to imagine this idealistic society where there is no war where there is no bloodshed where there is no hatred but it's just that it's an ideal it's a good thing to aim for but yeah, yeah, you've yeah got, okay you, right you've got okay. to make peace with the fact that you're probably never going to get there mm. but at the same time this is how i see it going one let's say a country like germany let's say the entire europe is now this anarchic society it's not really there's no centralized government there's no national defense now a country like germany goes full on imperialist and they start just conquering the shit out of their neighbors and they start accumulating resources and they build their war machine now let's say for example hap- uh, the scenario happens that you just mentioned where all these other little societies realize oh shit germany just went full on imperialist 
we need to band together to stop this. Then they band together, form a centralized, basically, defense, and they form basically another alliance that also goes imperialist. And then these two forces just accumulate to cancel each other out, and you end up with two super states that just have to, can't go back to anarchy. They have to kind of stay centralized and co uh, cohesive to kind of counter each other. You can't go back to your original anarchic society because then the other imperialist force will just take over, and then you end up with two big centralized states. Well, you've, you've got to ask yourself the question, why would you want to take another person's shit? Why don't you ask them how they got that shit and then go get your own? Why do you need <laughs> to only, take someone only, else's? If only it was that simple. If you look at history, man, there's always an uh, abundance of reasons why people think they should take the guy on the other side of the hill shit, man. Like, that's basically what human history is made of. That's if I can sum it up. It's basically a bunch of people banding together to take someone else's shit. Right. And I, I, I know this happens. But then it becomes your own responsibility to protect your shit. If it's up <laughs> to the guy with the bigger gun, get yourself a gun. It doesn't necessarily have to be a big gun, but it kind of levels the playing field if you've got a gun. Where, where this, where, okay, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll admit that this kind of falls apart when you get to things like tanks and, and, and artillery nuclear and nuclear weapons and chemical weapons. Like, I don't think everybody should have a tank parked in their backyard. I don't think that's feasible. But um, a, 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 a group of people could get a tank <laughs> if, they, if they had the resources and the knowledge to operate it. And... <laughs> Like that's yeah. that's peak li uh, libertarianism. A tank in every backyard. It's my yard. <laughs> <laughs> right, but uh, you you talked about Germany suddenly becoming imperialistic, but it's not going to be that sudden. It's going to start really small. It's going to be one guy that says, "Hey, listen, why don't we band together and go take those people's shit, and then we can we can tell them how to live." It needs to stop there already. People need to be a little bit more. Um, if I can use the term woke, um, about the problems in their societies, about the bad elements in their societies. You need to, to, to deal with problems when they're still small, because otherwise it's going to reach a critical mass and then it's going to explode all over you and it's going to be shit for <laughs> everybody. You so, just put a very uh, innuendo image in my mind with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't intend to, but I was going for a bomb metaphor. <laughs> No, man, but I think, and I've done some reading myself, and it's definitely, that is the main argument against anarchism, is the fact that if you look at human history, if you look at, for example, what Hobbes wrote about, the state of nature, the state of nature basically is anarchy, where everyone just fends for themselves, but then you get a group of people that realize if we band together, we can be more effective, we can be more prosperous, and then another group realizes, but these oaks over there are banding together, if we do the same, we can also be more prosperous. And that's kind of how states or basically, well, first city states and then national states originated was people realizing if we work together on a more centralized level and we have a government that actually orchestrates how resources are spent, then we can be much more effective and we can gather much more resources than if we just existed as a, a harmonious, anarchic state of nature community. Can I, can I tell you a story that might serve as a counter argument? It's, it's a... Uh, it's, it's, it's only the one example that I can think of now, but it's, it's something that you ought to know very well. And that's that the, 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 the Bura, Titans, uh, uh, during the, the, the first, uh, the, the first freedom war, um, we fucked up the English. Mm. And we didn't we didn't have all the resources. Yeah, there. maybe for before you go on, just give a little bit of like very laymanistic uh, context for the audience. So, what's this war you're talking about in the South African context? Okay, so um, the, the the Dutch settled in the Western Cape, um, or what is now the Western Cape. They called it the the Cape of Good Hope, Cape de Goede Hoop, um, and they started farming because that that's kind of that, that's kind of what they were doing or that what they were sent to do. They had to to start farming so that the um, that so that the Europeans could have a little halfway house to stop at on their trip to India to get spices and silk and and all, and all of those nice things. 
Then the British showed up, and for a while we, you know, we we kind of humoured them. We left them alone. They started their own little um, exploits into Africa, but they didn't infringe on us. And then we, um, we 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 became this economic powerhouse, and the British decided that they needed to take that. They came in, and they just disrupted everything. A lot of Afrikaans people weren't, uh, and, and by that time, I do think they were Afrikaans rather than Dutch. Um, I, I think that cultural sh shift had happened um, by that point. They, they decided they didn't want to, to have these English here, but they could still move. There was still a lot of landscape in Africa for them to take, um, and they moved north. They, the, 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 the great trek, the, the Groot Trek, um, they moved away from the English because it was better than, than fighting them. And then they struck it lucky, or rather unlucky. They discovered shit tons of diamonds, gold, platinum, everything that the British Empire is built on. Every like the, the reason they go to Africa apart from slaves is to get these resources because the British Isle doesn't really produce much of its own. Um, they, they import everything. They're, they're, they're quite small and uh, they're too small for the amount of people that they need to feed and, and, and give televisions and, and uh, weaponry and all of that for. So they go and exploit other countries or now they've got trade deals with other countries. Um, but they, they they take things from other countries and um, they decided to invade us. But they had a big problem. Um, we were semi-educated when it came to guns. We we knew our way around a gun. We weren't some, some uh, spear-throwing African tribe and we completely fucked them up within seven months. <laughs> we could pick them out 100 meters away because they wore these bright red suits. We called them rednecks, Roynecker. And red um, grasshoppers. Yes. Like we and and we 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 also had this defense structure where we take um so before you before uh, you like, continue just on that idea, a small nation of little farmers in South Africa completely changed the att attire of the British Empire. Because we were picking them off because they were standing out against the, the more like bleak South African uh, background. Right. Just let we, that sink in. We, we, we dressed like farmers. We, we, we dressed in the clothing that we could make ourselves, um, that, that we could get in, in that environment. And that was mostly like uh, uh, grayish green khaki clothes. And we completely changed the uniform of, 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 the, of, of the British Army because... Um, if you look like grass in a land covered in grass and it's big <laughs> yellow grass, not not like green lawn grass, it's 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 these these big long, almost um, uh, wheat looking grass. You you can't really get shot. People don't see you. You're, you're like a shadow. Um, and we, we we completely capitalized on 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 the, the failure of the British to notice this, to notice that mm. they stand out like sore thumbs, like the the, the the cartoon red thumb that 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 just got stubbed against something. Yes. Um, big, bright, and red. You can see them from very far away. So and, right, you're you're making the argument that well, wait, wait continue. I see you have an uh, uh, idea to finish. Yeah, and and the, the the British Army was highly highly organized. They had orders and they had people willing to follow through on those orders. They were an organized army. You joined the army not because you wanted to defend your country, but because it paid the bills. Um, you, like going into the army was a career option. And in many countries, America, America, I think, is, is, is probably the, the strongest example I can think of. Um, they, they, they still do this and those armies are very, very effective. But this ragtag bunch of, of uneducated, uh, really pious boor people who just wanted to be left alone wasted them. <laughs> um, we, 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 we used guerrilla warfare because we, we couldn't really open up lines of communication as quickly. Um, we had people on, on, on horses that, that took um, messages to and from people like Paul Krier um, or, or General de la Rai. But um, we, we didn't have the massive infrastructure that the English had access to. Um, and we, yeah, we, we, we culled them. 
we chased them away <laughs> we sent them running um but then they 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 came back with with khakis and bigger guns and more people yeah. and, and um they put our women and children in concentration camps and they completely destroyed our culture so that's a that's a topic for another stream yeah so basically the the argument that you're making is that that initial boer um society was very anarchical yes yes i i, I do think so and my uh twitter uh uh username general meant um he's he, it's 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 a he's a bit of a phantom like people don't really agree agree on whether he existed or not but he was this this freiburger he he was a free person who stood up against the english he did it on his own and there are all these heroic stories about him and i don't really think he existed but i believe in his ideas that he didn't he didn't need a government to tell him what to do he 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 went out and 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 he he fought against the english um with his friends with his like sort of sidekick dude and people loved him people loved what he was doing and people in the free state to some degree sometimes still tell their stories although i think that's that's more for for our parents generation you know their grandparents telling them these stories about general maniki's mates mm -hmm. um but th that that kind of culture that um that uh vigilante hero that takes charge of a situation and does something organizes a community and and takes back things from the english that's very very rooted in in afrikaans culture and and that i think is a very anarchical trait oh right okay yeah i get what you're saying so then basically well to to do a little of a segue I think, because uh, this is where it started, was my critique of anarchism. And I think uh, it can be summed up in basically my um, criticism of communism as well. Communism is too much centrality, while anarchy is the opposite. It's too little centrality. So I would think, in my own political view, I'd probably say I'm a monarchist to some extent. The fact that I want to keep government as small as possible. It needs to do things like national defense, diplomacy, uh, basic services. But at the same time, don't you think that could be uh, an anarchistic society with a very limited government, where government is actively kept artificially small? There's a, co a concerted effort to keep bureaucracy limited. Don't you think that could be a refined version of anarchy, where there is actually a government, a centralized government, but it's kept artificially small, like a monarchistic society? Right. So, so what you're saying is that that there should be some some uh, s small government organization that that um, uh, solves the problems that that arise in society. Is, it's is the, right? basically a, a, an entity that, for example, let's say an imperialistic force threatens your anarchistic society, uh, an entity that would be able to mobilize people and order people and basically just give guidance in terms of, OK, this is the situation we need to act. X, Y, and Z, this is your job. This is the current situation. We are in a, in a crisis situation. This is what we need to do to avert this. Okay. Um, and uh, another question to, to sort of lead into my answer. Do you think that um, the people who, who make these decisions, who organize the communities, who, who decide when to act, do you think they should be experts in their field, that they should be heavily invested in a certain part of society? Well, then you're going into uh, Plato's theory of philosopher kings, where you basically have a government made up of people that are experts in their fields. And I think in an idealistic situation, that would be ideal. But at the same time, I can't really see it manifesting in practice in the real world. Um, so what 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 I mean is, is we should have people who, who care deeply about their particular field of interest and, and we already do i mean people have their hobbies they're really invested in what goes on in this hobby and if everybody takes an interest in something um it it ought to spread out um evenly across everything because if something gets left out people are going to notice and then they're going to do then then some people are going to get a little interested and they're going to check maybe I can do this quickly and it filters through until you get someone who is completely invested in solving this problem who is leading that um that 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 
that uh, drive to 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 fix whatever uh, whatever problem there is in the in, in the society, or if it's a a foreign invader to mobilize masses of people um, to get their tanks that they parked in their backyards and and drive to uh, set designated locations that are easily defensible, and um, uh, fight off these invaders, fight off these fucking assholes who want to come take our shit. Um, right. And in the, yeah, continue. Um, so I, I don't think it's it's a philosopher king type of situation. It's it's a mobilization of the community from uh, uh, this this drive to be better, to want to fix problems in society, not just problems that you already understand, but maybe problems that you have the ability to understand. Um, so if, if there's a problem in a related field, you might be able to give people in that field some advice. You come at it from a different angle. Um, and it's always those those uh, unorthodox ideas that leave a mark in history because they change everything. It's this revolutionary new idea that completely blindsided everybody but made so much sense. And right, it no, I get what you're saying, yeah. But then at the same time, I want to raise the question, and I've seen this happen a lot of times on South African Twitter, is people referring to uh, crime in South Africa, or for example, that uh, truck that got looted a few days ago, they refer to that as anarchy. They're saying South Africa is devolving into anarchy, almost in a, in a derogatory way. What is your opinion on people that use, is that a misuse of the term anarchy? That is absolutely a misuse of the word anarchy. Anarchy doesn't mean looting lawlessness and, yeah it doesn't mean lawlessness it doesn't mean immorality it just means there's no government standing over your shoulder telling you what to do if you look at the the, the etymology of the word anarchy as we know it today it comes from um uh, uh the the greek word anarchos and meaning without arcos meaning ruler or chief um it it's just not telling you how to act um, or forcing no gods, you, no masters. No gods, no masters. There's no one forcing you to act in a certain way. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't impose some ideas on yourself. Um, if, if, or um, you, it, it also doesn't mean that, that you as a bystander to this looting and rioting couldn't, can't intervene. Because the, um, the, Governments kind of want people to stay out of these things because then people get hurt. But people are going to get hurt regardless. And the problem is going to be solved faster if people take part in solving the problem. Stopping people from burning trucks, burning down libraries when they're unhappy because obviously it doesn't work. But the people doing this don't understand that or don't necessarily understand that. They think that this is their only option. Um, and I tweeted this at someone earlier, but it's a it, it's a quote of Voltaire that says, "No problem can assault uh, can withstand the assault of sustained thinking." Um, if you can can tell people, but look at all these other options, then they can think about them. They can consider all the options at their disposal, and they can make an informed decision that doesn't necessarily lead to to rioting, or or, or burning things down. That doesn't lead to destruction. Um, we should look. We, we should try to educate people to to turn away from destroying things when you're unhappy, and maybe trying to fix the problem on your own. So it's it's not an easy fix to get people to to stop thinking about anarchy in this way because it's so rooted in society. Every time something goes wrong, people say, "But look, this is anarchy." But mm. it's a misuse of the word. It's not anarchy. It's right. Chaos. And on that same on that same note, uh, in the chat, Ches Berger asks, uh, "Is anarchy not equal to chaos?" No, no, because chaos um, would be where everybody. It's chaos is is kind of like the nihilistic dream where you can murder and take drugs and nobody can judge you for it. That's that's not what I'm, that's that's not what anarchists are saying. Anarchists are saying that um, you don't need someone stopping you from doing immoral acts to not do immoral acts. Why do you why do you promote this 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 idea that you need to be stopped from being immoral from committing murder no just take charge of your own life make your own decisions 
and leave the other people out of it. Don't infringe on other people's rights to do what they want to do. And this includes killing them because then you effectively remove all their agency. They're dead. They don't matter anymore. Um, don't rape them because then they don't then they can't consent or then they didn't consent. They don't like this. It's it's not fun. Anarchy is 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 an equal system where everybody is equal insofar as you can protect yourself, insofar as you can protect your own rights. Right, okay. No, I think that's a, a important thing to clear up, the fact that, and because that's a misconception I see a lot of people, and that's the uh, a lot of people voice, and I think that's a core idea of the stream, is to uh, dispel some of those misconceptions. A lot of people like to use the word anarchy too, describe lawlessness and chaos and basically the deterioration of any societal cohesion and you're saying that that's a bit off the mark yeah because it, it it's not the the, the 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 total loss of social cohesion it's um that only happens if you allow it to happen you don't need people telling you to stay together to stay together if you know it's better for you to stay together Right. But you also need to know that staying together in the situation is the better option. It has a better right. chance to keep more people happy. Mm, right. And uh, my final question for you in terms of the on the point of anarchy is the fact of <coughs> applying to South Africa. Do you, are you of the opinion that uh, anarchistic system of governance could actually be beneficial to South Africa uh, as opposed to what our current system is as manifested at? Uh, I take offense at your, you, at, 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 at your saying it's an anarchistic um, way of governance because it, there's no governance. Um, yeah, it's, right. So, um, but to, to answer the question at the moment, definitely not. The people in this country aren't educated enough as a whole, as, as, as a cohesive South African group. We don't have enough educated people to stop societies from divulging into chaos. Um, we, we, we don't have that, that, that notion of, of um, solidarity with other South Africans or with other people of the same race or same gender to stop that from happening because we, we purposefully alienate other people. Um, we, we, we kind of like doing that because it means that we never have to look at ourselves. We never have to, to do anything. But when you read about all the different social problems in the world, when you read about all the different things that people have done, you stop and you think, but wait, maybe I'm doing some of these things. You know, I think this mm. is really, really bad behavior. I don't support it, but I might be guilty. Right. And then you look inward and you change. And with that change, you learn something. And that, that, that what you learn, you should be able to spread to other people. Don't impose it on mm. other people. But you can you can spread your ideas just like we're doing the stream now. We're talking mm. to each other. We don't necessarily agree on everything, but we're sharing ideas. We're talking to people. We're trying mm. to understand the other point of view. Because right. we and you're basically saying that the internet is a form of anarchy to an extent. Oh yes, the internet is both the best and the worst example of anarchy I can think of. It's the best because it allows this, this, this fr free market of ideas. Um, you can go to Twitter and you can type out exactly what you believe. You don't have to go through a government representative to, to say something. You can type out exactly what you believe and some people are going to see it. Some people might even think that, that it's something to be discussed and then they can talk about it. You, can, um, you, you don't have to impose your ideas on anybody else to get your message out there. And on even more... Um, uh, uh like more structured platforms um like like uh reddit you you get this this um uh like category on subcategory on subcategory thing that happens where people get so specific um about what they believe and they they, they form these little groups where they can further their own ideas without pissing anyone else off because no one else is seeing it they can talk about it. They can they can be proud of themselves without having to look over their shoulders and think, but what about all these other people? They're not in a public space anymore. Right. Um, so it, it the internet gives you a chance to to change yourself and um, promote your ideas 
and it gives you a chance to um, to to further your ideas, to to grow your ideas with other people who believe kind of the same thing, with people who mostly agree with you on a certain topic. Um, but the reason the, the internet is a is a bad example of anarchy is because you also get really bad groups of people on the internet that sit and they fester. Um, they get kicked off of, of one platform and kicked off of another platform until they end up somewhere where they don't get kicked off. And then all of these really nasty ideas also get a voice. Um, things like we should murder all white people or murder all black people or black people aren't human or um you know jews are the reason for for all of our problems um that kind of thinking is is a closed loop you assume yeah. that jews or white people or black people are bad then you go to people who believe that and then they just give you what, what you said they, they just feed you information that you already know and you don't get an opportunity to grow right. and like almost like a, a echo chamber idea but anyway right. uh, fantastically depressing in the chat asks so does an anarchic society only then work when everyone is on the same cost or on the same level um well, there, there is no if everyone is on the same cast or same level because everyone is assumed to be part of the same cast or on the same level. There, there is no other option because you can't, you can't tell me that I'm worthless um, and you can't tell me that I'm better than anyone else because you have absolutely no proof of it. You can only say that my ideas are better than someone else's ideas, but that's also just your opinion. Um, me as a person, I am an individual, I'm different from you, but we are biologically, evolutionarily, um, existentially, we're exactly the same thing with um, different ideas and, right. and, and, and ways to, to express them. Okay. And I think that is a very good point to end the stream on. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with the audience before you wrap it up? Um wait <laughs> uh, while you think on it i'll give my final thoughts as well so basically tonight was uh, the third episode of stream of consciousness i've had nick von Roe on i've had um starboard disagrees on and both of them are pretty right leaning so you're my first basically left leaning guest on the show and i wanted to give a bit of more of a, a ideological diversity in terms of people that i interview because i think that's the the beautiful thing about the internet is that you can get different types of viewpoints you can challenge your own view viewpoints and you can talk to people that don't necessarily agree with you i mean you and me don't agree on let's say uh 20 30 percent maybe even more of the the basic questions in in political science if you want to make it even broader a broad cast a broader net we don't agree on even half of the same uh, policies or issues on the on our stances towards but at the same time we can have a conversation we can exchange ideas and people can tune in to listen as well and i think that is the future of the internet is that tv is definitely dying out and people can get a niche if you want to listen to an interview or a talk on anarchism you can find it on on uh, on youtube and you can find someone on on twitter that can talk about anything that you want you can tune into any type of channel and you can get information it's the library of alexandria on steroids you can basically find any type of niche piece of knowledge that you are interested in and you can do research on it and i think that's that'll be my final thought what do you have to say um, I just want to to caution people because you, you you said you can find your niche and and my final thought would be um, don't get stuck in your niche don't get stuck in your own little ideological world because then no one can 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 change you and you might end up doing something wrong without realizing it so take part in discussions like these go out and 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 talk to people who are willing to talk to you don't don't harass people. Um, uh, about topics that they're not willing to talk about but if they want to talk to you in a bar uh, at your house on the internet discuss it with them because you might learn something um, right. you might you, you might be able to go okay you know that's a very fair point i never thought about that and those moments are are absolutely beautiful to me 
Mm, I think that's a very beautiful final thought, definitely. So, Claude, can you please tell the audience where they can reach you and what is your what are your plans for the future? What's what can they expect from your YouTube channel, uh, seeing as it's pretty new and in its infant stage? Um, well, I'm not completely clued up with how YouTube exactly works, um, so I don't know how to give you that link, but I'm sure you can get it from from Conscious Caracal. It, yeah, um, the link is in the description to Claude's Twitter and his YouTube channel that he created today. <laughs> Right, so you can you can check me out on Twitter, um, and I am planning to start uh, putting videos up on YouTube that explain my ideas and and look at the world through uh, an an anarchist lens and and give a, a perspective from that point of view because I think it's it's really underrepresented in the world. It's it's written off too easily. So I I want to to put that idea out there. And if you've got anything to say to me, whether it's criticism or or if you want to call me a moron or whatever, I don't know, lay it on me, I love it, um, tweet me, uh, I don't know, leave a comment on, on, on my YouTube channel, um, mm. and I will get back to you as soon as I can. That's the perfect way to approach the matter, I think. So definitely thank you for everyone for tuning in. This has been the third episode of Stream of Consciousness. I think it was an excellent discussion on a topic that I've actually only recently really started delving into uh, thank you claude for coming on i'll definitely invite you on for a future stream and you did pretty well for your first uh, live conversation if i do say so myself <laughs> thank you I, th I think i had a bit of a rocky start but um <laughs> it's it's really really great to 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 be on here to to be able to get my ideas out there and um yeah below <laughs> right and cheers from the dark continent have a good one